Okay, let's get started. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming this morning. I realize it's kind of a difficult morning to make it in this morning. Glad you're here. Um, let's talk a little bit about where we are and where we're going. Uh, hopefully now you are well into your final project where you have a little bit more freedom to sketch out how exactly you want to go about teaching your naive users ASL. And remember the goal here is that you want to try and teach them with as little verbal instruction as possible. No English uh, text on the screen explaining what to do and you're not going to be telling them verbally. Question? Yeah, so I realize I missed last semester. Okay. Missed last time, but sure. if you want to go over like teaching them letters and stuff, we're allowed to put up the letter that we're teaching. You can put up the actual letter, right? So you they can can't say sign A. Exactly, right? So you can use English words and letters and numbers as long as it's not direct instructions about what they're supposed to be doing. If you flash up the number four, it should be pretty clear that they're trying to do this. Question? So with that said, can yes. we assume that they know numbers at least? Or you can assume that they know numbers, okay. exactly. Yeah, that's right. Question? Would it be cool for an intern video to do like a start screen, end screen, what, like, what do you mean by start screen and screen? I mean, like, you develop, like, like, uh, I don't know, like a GUI to start with the C high score. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. As long as it's not telling them what to do, okay. that's perfectly fine. It doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be intelligent. If there's a, yeah, if there's a button or a menu that has a word on it that they can click on to see something, that's perfectly fine. Okay. That's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. they, they yep. Yeah, they can press keyboard buttons, that's fine. I was, better make sure it's the right hand, right? You gotta think about physical context here. What exactly are they doing? As long as they're signing with their dominant hand, if you want them to be doing things on the keyboard or mouse or keypad with their inferior hand, that's, that's fine too. Do they know to do that? If they click, they probably will click with their dominant hand, which means these are all the things we wanna see that at least you're, you're thinking about. And in user testing, which you will be demonstrating in interim video, uh, interim video two, if they do make a mistake, at least that that's being captured, and then in interim video three, that you're altering your interface to try and reduce that particular form of confusion. Yes. So would you just be able to clarify we're not adding another functionality after the first interim, it's just testing the user Absolutely. So uh, in interim video one, adding new functionality. Interim video two, testing that functionality. Interim video three, uh, improving on that and so on. Is that due after the Good question. Yes, it's due two weeks from now. So interim video uh, one is due tomorrow night. And then interim video, or sorry, interim video one is due tomorrow night. Interim video two, two weeks from now, which will give you plenty of chance to test out your system on friends and family during the Thanksgiving break, hopefully. Yes? Um, so on the paperwork for the final project, it said that we need to be able to show like the start of our added functionality, so if it's not completely polished by tomorrow night. Cor that's fine, okay. that's right, exactly. There should be enough there. They can see the- There content. should be enough there to see it, and, and again, for your, in interim video two, for your user to be able to test it out. Now you may have made improvements on your functionality by, by this point, that's, that's fine as well. But we want to see that you made a start on that. Yes? Uh, I will check with the TA today. Uh, I think he has not graded nine yet, or 10? Nine and 10 both. All right, I will check with Jack and get him to work on that for you. Other questions about the final project? No? Okay. So again, interim video one due tomorrow night. Um, I am going to be assessing proposals for the government on Wednesday, uh, Thursday and Friday. I'm not traveling. I promised I wouldn't do any more traveling this semester. However, uh, Uncle Sam has decided to start bright and early at 8.30 in the morning on th uh, Thursday morning. So I will not be here to teach. Uh, another one of my PhD students uh, will be here, Colin Capel. Colin is getting ready to defend his PhD thesis. He's done a lot of amazing work on the nuts and bolts of simulation and visualization that we use in our lab to study robotics. So another lecture on visual design. 
He has some pretty amazing uh, videos and demos to show you guys, so please do uh, be here on Thursday morning for that. There will be no quiz uh, Thursday night, and then we're all off for the Thanksgiving break. When we come back from the Thanksgiving break, we will dive into our uh, final uh, theme of the course, which is looking inward, where we're going to look at this interesting aspect of HCI, where the digital and the physical world are starting to blur. That's where we're headed. And then, as I mentioned last time, during our exam period, there is no written final exam in this course. Instead, we are going to see 60 two minute and 30 second uh, videos of all the different ways that you can teach ASL using a lead motion device. And all the instructions are, are up there in the PDF linked from there. Any other questions? No? Okay, so back to lecture. Uh, we're working our way through uh, this four segment course on robotics. I had a fifth uh, lecture here that you might have remembered seeing Robot Crowd interaction, uh, interaction, that's our lecture on Twitch Plays Robotics, which I actually covered this year when we talked about crowdsourcing. So just a little bit of restructuring here uh, since last time. We talked about Breitenberg vehicles, interactions with the physical world and what that means. We then looked at, and we're going to finish this lecture today, on robots that are interacting not just with the physical world, but with humans specifically, and what are some of the specific challenges and opportunities that exist when we're trying to design social robots. And then finally, we'll look at robot swarms today. Robots that have to deal with the physical world, the social world of humans, and communicating and interacting with other robots so that together they can do something that is difficult or impossible for any robot to do on its own. Okay, so let's finish up our lecture on social robots. And we ended last time with a little thought exercise about a rehabilitation robot. Um, and this was an opportunity for you to think about trying to at least mentally design a robot that would incorporate one or more of the four social building blocks that we talked about last time. For example, a, a rehabilitation robot might want to partake in turn taping, taking, not necessarily verbal turn taking, but perhaps the rehabilitation robot demonstrates an action. And any socially aware adult will realize if the robot does something and then looks at the human, that's a nonverbal cue to imitate what I, what I do, right? The robot might then saccade or look at the arm of the patient as the patient tries to imitate what the robot does. The robot may then go back and uh, perform another action, but perhaps a more gentle action because it realizes that the patient is not able to imitate what the robot just did, might start with a gentle action and then gradually move the patient up to their original full range of motion. What is that process called? Scaffolding, right? So we've already talked about a lot of the other aspects of social interaction that, that come to play here. Obviously in a single lecture we could only cover a few of these. There are dozens if not hundreds of these little social building blocks that you might not even be aware of. But for those of you that don't do go and work on social technologies, even if it's not uh, a robot, some of these aspects of what humans expect from social interaction may be something you think about building into your interactive technology. For example, you might have gone to work for uh, the Jibo Corporation. Anybody know about the Jibo Corporation? Don't give away the answer. We'll play, we'll play the ad first, and then we'll talk about Jibo himself. Um, in this video, you're going to see Jibo. We talked about this in one of the Oh, you saw Jibo already. Stole my thunder. OK. Did you, see the, did you see the ad? It was pretty creepy, right? OK. All right. I will save you the pain of watching it again, though. though. Yes. <laughs> was it in a guest lecture? Guest lectures weren't taped. It's two, it's two minutes long. Let's watch it one more time. I want you this time to pay attention, aside from the creepiness, all the kinds of very simple social building blocks, some of which we talked about last time, some of which we didn't, that are built into Jibo. This is your house. This is your car. This is your toothbrush. These are your things. But these are the things that matter. And somewhere in between is this guy. Introducing Jibo the world's first family robot. Say hi, Jibo. Hi, Jibo. 
Jibo helps everyone out throughout their day. He's the world's best cameraman. By intelligently tracking the action around him, he can independently take video and photos so that you can put down your camera and be a part of the scene. Jibo, take the picture. He's a hands-free helper. You can talk to him, and he'll talk to you back, so you don't have to skip a beat. Excuse me, Anne? Yes, Jibo. Melissa, just sent a reminder that she's picking you up in half an hour to go grocery shopping. Thanks, Jibo. He's an entertainer and educator. Through interactive applications, Jibo can teach. Let me in, or else I'll... Ha! And I'll... Ha! And I'll blow your house in! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? There you are. <laughs> He's the closest thing to a real-life teleportation device. He can turn and look at whoever you want with a simple tap of your finger. Check out my turkey dinner, Mom. I wish you wouldn't eat that. Hey, they make turkey pizza? I want turkey pizza. <laughs> and he's a platform, so his skills keep expanding. He'll be able to connect to your home. Welcome home, Eric. Hey, buddy. Can you order some takeout for me? Sure thing. Chinese, as usual? You know me so well. And even be a great wingman. You have a voice message from Ashley. Want to hear it? Absolutely. Hey, call me when you're home. Better make that takeoff for two, Jiba. We've dreamt of it for years, and now he's finally here. And he's not just an aluminum shell, nor is he just a three-axis motor system. He's not even just a connected device. He's one of the family. <laughs> Are you still there? <laughs> How many of you have a Jibo? If you didn't buy one, you're out of luck. Unfortunately, the Jibo company went bankrupt three years, uh, three weeks ago. Um, they were outcompeted by some alternate products. Sorry? <laughs> Anybody know? What, what, what? It's probably like Alexa and Google Home and Facebook or uh, Exactly. So Alexa and Siri and all the rest of it, unfortunately, voice recognition for the moment seems to be enough. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the field of robotics about the uncanny valley. You might have heard about this before. Um, creepy robots like Jibo and zombies tend to fall into the uncanny valley. They're kind of like us, but not quite like us. Purely inanimate objects are on one side of the valley. Fully functioning and socially capable adult humans are on the other side of the valley. Things that are in between tend to seem creepy to us. Okay, aside from the creepiness of Jibo, what are some of the social building blocks that Jibo is attempting here? Absolutely. So can Jibo uh, participate in joint attention? Could it, could Jibo draw your attention to an object you would jointly attend to it, right? This is probably about the most minimal system you can imagine that would be capable of such a thing, right? That was the idea behind Jibo. What is the simplest possible machine you can make that can exhibit a lot of these basic social building blocks? So joint attention, what else? Facial recognition. Facial recognition, right? So Jibo can tell whether you've actually successfully attended to what Jibo wants you to attend to. Um, recognizing when you're being listened to. Okay, absolutely. Just really expressive, like for just having like a little dot in the center, you can make all sorts of like mimicking of. Uh... Absolutely, right? So there's HCI at work right there, right? You don't need a face to exhibit facial expressions. Kind of an interesting finding. I was going to say specifically that the ball in the center often looks like an eye that can signal facial expressions, like instead of a smile, the eye would go like this. Absolutely, right? So is it, right, is it, is it an eye, is it a mouth, is it a face? Whatever it is, it's somehow triggering the right social circuitry there uh, most of the time. Okay, the designers of Jibo, um, uh, the CEO of the company, Cynthia Brazil, she previously was a graduate student and built 
Kismet. You remember last week we looked at the Kismet videos. Kismet was also pretty simple. This was obviously the natural extension of that, trying to make that as simple as possible. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem society's ready for Jibo yet, but, but who knows? Who knows? Someday. Someday. Okay, so let's switch gears now and talk instead about um, swarm intelligence. We focus so far on how robots should interact with physical environments, how robots should interact with people, how about robots interacting with other robots. Again, to guide our discussion today about collective robotics, we're going to again redraw this cartoon where we have two agents that are interacting with one another. The output of one becomes the input to another and vice versa. Now the form, the actual uh, outputs and inputs to these different individuals of the swarms are going to be very different in terms of the swarms that we look at. But again, in all of these projects, we're going to try and adopt the Breitenberg philosophy, which is we're going to try and create as simple a machine as possible. We're going to program as little complexity in here as possible. What is the minimally complex machine we need to make so that the machines can coordinate their action and do whatever it is that we want the swarm as a whole to do. That's the idea. Okay, Here's, uh, there's several of these out there now. Here's a recent example uh, I found on the web, Zooids. Okay, kind of a simple example, and again, I'm not sure how many of these actual tasks would be useful, but a, a simple example, it's getting easier and easier for us to actually create these physical swarms. We'll come back to physical swarms in a moment, but let's go back in history a little bit. Let's go back all the way to the 1940s, 1948 specifically. We're going to look at one of the first, or the first robot swarm. Not only was it the first robot swarm, it was the first uh, autonomous robot. This was built by uh, Gray Walter, and he named his robots uh, Machina Speculatrix. They're machines with which to speculate about the nature of intelligent behavior. Okay. They were built to prove a point that was only much later clarified by Breitenberg back in the 1980s, that you could build a simple machine using, in this case, late 1940s technology, long before uh, digital computers. Um, this was all analog. Uh, and if you built the simple machine in the right way and you thought about how it might interact with the environment and other machines, you can get some relatively rich uh, behavior. If you ever make it to the Smithsonian, you can actually go and see a replica that was built by one of my colleagues. Unfortunately, the originals uh, haven't survived, but uh, you can go and see a copy of Machina Speculatrix. <coughs> In a simple villa on the outskirts of Bristol lives Dr. Gray Walter, a neurologist, who makes robots as a hobby. They are small and he doesn't dress them up to look like men. He calls them tortoises. And so cunningly have their insides been designed that they respond to the stimuli of light and touch in a completely lifelike manner. is named Elsie and she sees out of a photoelectric cell which rotates above her body. When light strikes the cell, driving and steering mechanism sends her hurrying towards it. But if she brushes against any object in her path, contacts are operated that turn the steering away and so automatically she takes avoiding action.
Walter's pet is Elmer, Elsie's brother, in the darker vest. He works in exactly the same way. Dr. Walter says that his electronic toys work exactly as though they have a simple two-cell nervous system, and that with more cells they will be able to do many more tricks. Already Elsie has one up on Elmer. When her batteries begin to fail, she automatically runs home to her kennel for charging up, and in consequence can live a much gayer life. Okay, in terms of a historical document for robotics, very interesting. Also an interesting historical document, period. All right. So, um, Elmer and Elsie, not a very sophisticated swarm, but we do have two robots, and they interact with one another, which we'll see uh, in a moment. It's interesting to think about the progression of robotics compared to computers. This is the late 1940s. Computers at that time would fill the room and they would do one one hundredth of what your cell phone does today or a millionth of what your cell phone does today. Think about those computers and then these computers. Then think about Elser and El uh, Elmer and Elsie and then the Roomba robot. It's kind of interesting to think about. We've made relatively little progress with robotics, a lot with computers. Why? For those of you who have taken my robotics course, we've talked about this before. Why? Um, brains are good at movement and computers aren't. Brains are good at movement and computers aren't, right? Movement requires moving about in the physical world. A lot of the challenges in robotics are actually HCI challenges, right? Thinking carefully about interacting with the real world, the social world, other machines, and so on. Computers have the luxury of being isolated from the physical world, right? We carry them around, they sit on our desk, they talk to the internet, that's about it. They passively get input from us. They don't need to move, they don't need to interact in interesting ways with the physical world, which made it relatively easy to make progress in making them smarter and faster and more robust and so on. We're just at the beginning of figuring out how to do that with machines that interact in the real world. Much, much more difficult. Okay. Here's a, a sketch, again, this was a, an article from 1950 uh, that Gray Walter wrote and published in Scientific American that showed, again, this idea of machina speculatrix, that if you speculate with machines, it turns out that you can make very simple machines and get relatively rich behavior, like, for example, phototaxis, or moving towards uh, a light, or if you put two lights in the robot's uh, cage here, a pen, it will explore back and forth between the two. You might remember when we talked about Breitenberg vehicles, we talked about the Explorer, or the Curious Robot. That was Breitenberg taking a page out of Gray Walter's book. You'll notice in the case of phototaxis, the robot is actually describing a corkscrew pattern, a spiral pattern, and then approaching the light. Why might that be the case? Possibly. To determine where exactly the light source is? Maybe. Remember back to the Bradenburg vehicles that did respond to light, where if there was more light on one side, it would turn towards that. If there was more light on the other side, it would turn towards that. The further away, the less intense the light source is, and the more intense the wall reflection is. So it could be confused. It could be seeing other light sources. It, that's a good point. There could be reflections here. It turns out in this particular case, that's not the case. In other cases, it is. It still describes the, the spiral, even if there aren't any walls or complex reflections. If it's not facing directly towards the light, it's turning to over adjust, and so then it has to do the full turn around before it can get the chance. Absolutely. You might have missed it in the video, but he mentioned that there's just a single uh, light sensor in uh, Elmer's, or is it Elsie here, uh, in the robot's turret. So just one sensor, right? Breitenberg vehicles had two, which meant it could turn towards the brighter of the two. How do you go towards a light if you only have one light source? Physical context here. You have to sort of run the simulation of your mind, of the interaction between the robot, the single light sensor, and the single light source. You could spin the light sensor, that's possible, or in this case, you spin yourself. 
So it's driving in a spiral. The stronger the light, the straighter you drive. So you turn further to the right, the less light there is. So the spiral is tighter in darkness and gradually unravels as the robot moves towards the light. That's how you can achieve phototaxis with just a single light source. You could, of course, record light information, put it in storage, take the next light sensor value and take the difference between, but we're talking about 1940s technology now. No memory, just you need to react based on what's happening now. Even with such a very, very simple machine, it's possible to achieve, again, not very sophisticated behavior, but the building blocks of more interesting and complex behavior. You could have built a Roomba back in the 1940s. Okay. All right, so again, this is one, one robot, one light, one robot, two lights. What happens if you put a light bulb on Elmer and Elsie? Now we have, again, not a very big swarm, but a swarm nonetheless. Uh, you get in this case, quote unquote, the mating dance. So they move towards each other uh, with the light source, but each one is also moving in a corkscrew pattern. So from time to time, they move away from one another which tightens the curve of the other one, but then they turn back towards each other and you can get very, very complex trajectories <laughs> with these very, very simple machines. Okay, that's machines. What about animals? Animals also swarm and produce interesting... I don't think we need the sound for this one. Very interesting uh, complex behavior. Um, this is uh, starlings, which can flock in hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Are these individual starlings performing differential calculus in their heads? Maybe, they have slightly bigger heads than fruit flies, but given all that we've learned so far about simple internals, and exploiting interactions to get rich behavior? Probably not. Which starling is guiding the flock? Which one says, okay, everyone, we're heading this way now? It's a collective, right? How is this possible? How do they decide then? How do they decide which way to go? Don't stand too, yeah, don't be too close to one another. And don't be too far either, right? If it's just don't be too close, they'd all fly in opposite directions and there'd be no swarm. And if you get too far away, come back together. You put those two rules together, you tend to get something that sort of shivers in place. But there is a lot more going on here. There's a lot of coordinated motion. So don't get too close. Don't get too far. We're missing one more that produces coordinated motion. Stay in the air. Okay, that one's also important. Maybe four then. I don't know specifically what would drive it, but uh, I have heard that in humans, like crowd mentality is only takes six percent of the crowd on average. Like if the number is over a thousand, you know, the whole crowd. That could be. Uh, yep, yeah, humans are pretty good at this. Some humans are pretty good at this. Exactly. So if one of my neighbors is heading this way and my other neighbor is heading this way, I might take the average and head in the average direction. You put those three rules together and you get not just swarming, but coordinated uh, motion. And we'll look at these three little heuristics uh, in a moment. Back in the 1980s, um, the first film to use this was The Lion King which is going to take these three rules, don't get too close, don't get too far, and head in the average direction of my neighbors. And if you put that into uh, a computer graphics routine, you get very realistic uh, collective animal motion. <clears throat> You'll notice in a moment, the animals are not just uh, swarming together, they are also reacting to their physical environment, in this case, the box canyon. Mm -hmm. 
If you happen to have seen this in the theater when it was initially released, there was stunned silence in the, in the theater at the time, right? Now, obviously, this seems easy. This was really cutting edge at the time. The wildebeest are not just swarming with each other, but also reacting to uh, rocks in the Box Canyon here. Why? Why and how? Because if the wildebeest put through the boxes, um, the rocks, it wouldn't exactly be a very good scene. Uh, absolutely, that's right. So we need to make sure that they don't hit the, they don't hit the rocks. Um, but there's our three simple rules on the right in pictorial form. There's nothing in there about rocks. How do they avoid the rocks? Why? Don't get too close, right? Okay. So um, back in the 1980s, there was a computer graphics researcher named Craig Reynolds, and he came up with these three simple rules, separation, alignment, and cohesion. He put them into some simple computer graphics routine and got this beautiful swarming. That algorithm was adopted by Hollywood. There are now probably hundreds or thousands of these little heuristics that are used by uh, animators. But at heart, you don't need too many to get rich behavior. So um, a Boyd is any agent that's implementing these three rules. Each Boyd has a limited range of motion. It can't see the other thousand Boyds. It has a certain sensing radius, which is indicated by the gray circle here. It's able to detect in the position of its neighbors inside this circle. And in separation, it takes the positions of its neighbors, finds the mean position, and moves away from that mean position. So don't get too close. Cohesion is the inverse of that. Take the mean position and move towards it. The closer this mean position is to the boy, the more strongly it weights separation relative to cohesion. If the boy is sitting here and detects that the, uh, the average position is far from itself, it will weight the cohesion term more than the separation term. And then finally, it also detects not just the position of its neighbors, but also their heading, takes the average heading, and alters its own heading towards a little bit towards that average heading. And every Boyd in the Boyd swarm is, is running exactly the same algorithm. What happens if instead of putting in these two rules, you dropped in alignment and cohesion, but not separation? What would the swarm do? Not quite collapse in and out on itself. That would happen if we only used cohesion. Single file line, right? We still have alignment in there, so they're still aligning their heading, but they're also drawing inward towards each other, so they would collapse to a line or a point, right? So one way to build up an intuition for these is, again, to mentally simulate a swarm by adding or removing these terms. What would, what would happen if we turned up the gain or we made cohesion much stronger than the other two terms? What would the swarm look like in that case? Possibly. It would definitely get a lot tighter, right? Everything is trying to move closer together. You get a much tighter swarm. If you tune down the knob associated with cohesion, you get a much more diffuse swarm and so on. So you can imagine weighting these three, you can actually then treat them as parameters and create slightly different kinds of swarm behavior. What happens if now we take multiple swarms, we're going to combine them together, and the swarms are going to recognize members of their own swarm and members of their other swarm, and they're going to add either align, cohese, or separate differently for, for members of their own flock and those of, uh, of their own swarm and those of the other. So each boy is now going to have six numbers which are the weights it's going to associate with these three terms when it senses its friends. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth parameter are going to be different weights for these when it recognizes strangers, members of another group. Hiroki Sayama, a researcher, created this field, which he now calls swarm chemistry. So we're going to put in a bunch of different kinds of swarms that have different terms, mix them together, and see what happens.
How many different swarms are there here? Four. What are they doing? I think they're trying to go east, but there are other swarms in the way. Possibly. It's very difficult to reverse engineer what the actual weights on these terms are, but you can see that they're separating into layers. Possibly. Um, they are all repelled from members of other swarms more than they are like repelled from each other or could be. That's a good observation, right? There's probably a little bit more repulsion between swarms than there is within any one swarm. Um, when it starts, they're all randomly aligned, but when the green ones immediately collapse. Pretty amazing, huh? Yeah, it starts with the what the other ones are doing. Absolutely, right? So you've got this randomly, you've got this disorganized group of uh, boids in this case, or these could be machines, they could be autonomous cars, they could be drones, and very, very quickly they, they self-organize with very, very little coding, right? Very, very simple rules. You're all comfortable now with matplotlib or pygame. You could probably code one of these up in a few hours. It doesn't, doesn't take very long. Pretty interesting how with just a few lines of code, you get these very rich uh, interactions. Here's another heterogeneous swarm, swarm made up of multiple swarms. In this case, we have just two. They're trying to leave, yes, exactly. Back to the Breitenberg vehicles. These are the escape artists. They're trying to get out. There is no escape from the blue swarm heuristic in here, right? It's just cohese, separate, and align in slightly different proportions. If you look at the background lines, you'll see that they're all moving together now, pretty cleanly. And one more. Any guesses about the weightings of terms in this heterogeneous swarm? Attracted. The red ones are attracted to the green. True, but also repelled from them. Or maybe it's the green that are repelled from the red, but the red are not repelled from the green. Hard to say. Kind of hypnotic, aren't they? The green also doesn't really seem to have any sense of direction. It seems like all they care about is you know, staying a certain distance. That's it. So not a lot of collective action in one, one direction. Right? Very, very rich dynamics with very, very simple internals. OK. Let's have a look at another example. This one is a robotics example that, again, tries to, uh, tries to exploit or think carefully about physical context to get rich behavior with very, very simple machines. The physical context, in this case, is going to be the shape of the robot itself, its geometry. All right, let's start with the task. These robots are supposed to clean up, um, and these are uh, were built in Switzerland, but they're also Swiss robots. They like to keep everything organized and in its place. So the Swiss robots 
You will probably recognize this control algorithm. It's basically a Breitenberg vehicle. If there is stimulation on the front, so it has, as you can see in the little cartoon down here, two proximity sensors, one that points front left and the other one points front right. If the proximity sensor on the left uh, is broken, turn to the right. If the proximity sensor on the right is broken, turn to the left. If there's no stimulation on either side, it doesn't see anything on either side, go straight. What if it sees things on both sides? What if it sees things on both sides? I think it sort of rattles back and forth and backs up a little bit. And eventually, it will see only one and then move to the right. How does this possibly lead to clumping of these randomly distributed styrofoam blocks into nice, neat piles. Because it winds up pushing the blocks, because it's the only place it can't, it won't like turn away from them if they're directly in front of it. Absolutely. So if you look at the shape of the front nose of the robot, it has this flat part on the front, physical context, and it was designed in that way on purpose, so that it's possible for the robot to collide with the styrofoam block head on. And if it does, it does not see it. And if it does not see it, it goes forward. So it's now pushing a styrofoam block until? Well, consequently, it'll also not see a block one step spacing it and then go towards it. Absolutely. Another block and push that block. Absolutely. So if there's a block ahead of it, it'll drive towards it and start pushing that block. It might actually line up a couple of them and start pushing them until possibly or or it hits a wall is it likely to when it hits a wall hit the wall head on probably not it's likely to, to sort of approach the wall obliquely in which case one or the other of the proximity sensors fires and it turns in the opposite direction of what happens to the styrofoam cube that it was carrying. It gets dropped. So it's sliding, the styrofoam block is sliding along the left side of the front of the robot's face until, until the block hits the sensor and then it keeps turning or turns faster, right? Now there's a lot of stimulation on the left. It turns away and leaves the block there. Right. That's the case if it's pushing a styrofoam block and it, and it comes close to the wall, what else can happen? Um, once, once a wall is big enough to be seen by its side sensors, yep. then it will stop directing blocks to that wall and find another. Possibly. That's possible. So you can see in this little tiny cartoon here, it's pushed up uh, some uh, styrofoam blocks against the wall turns away and then it doesn't see the wall see the wall and goes off looking quote unquote for another block what else can happen why are some of these clumps uh, clumping up in the center rather than against a wall what's happening in that case there's a, another block that just happens to be in a place where it can cause the robot to drop like two blocks that it's going to be more likely for it to drop another block absolutely so again it might be difficult to see in the back but we have our little cartoon robot here it pushes the block, but there's a second block ahead of it, just front left. And as it starts pushing the, this first block, the second block comes into view of its left proximity sensor, which causes it to turn away, leaving the first block next to the second block. We have a clump, right? That clump is now obviously, um, the surface area is larger than any single block. So another robot pushing another block is more likely to detect this larger group and more likely to leave another block there, which means a third robot is even more likely to leave a block there. And once a clump gets started, it grows, uh, it, it, the size of it accelerates until all the styrofoam blocks have been cleared from the area, right? If you hadn't taken this class or hadn't walked you through the example and I had asked you to try and program in matplotlib a, uh, a block cleaning swarm of robots, you'd probably come up with a pretty complex program, right? Recognize the block, then look for the closest cluster, turn in that direction, go towards that cluster until you get there. Once you get there, turn away and so on and so on. We don't need all that complexity if we think carefully about 
the interaction, physical context, including the shape and type of the robot itself. All of these things can matter. Okay. Okay, back to robot swarms. We start to build in some of these simple routines, and now we're not talking about a swarm of two robots or four or ten, maybe a dozen or a thousand. If we want robots to coordinate their behavior in ever larger groups, again, there are things we can learn from animals and humans in terms of organizing collective action in very large groups. One of those is division of labor. At some point, it doesn't really make sense for everyone to be doing exactly the same thing. It's better for groups to specialize. We already just saw a simple example of that in the swarm chemistry uh, example. This is a, a little bit older uh, video. These are uh, Professor McClurkin's uh, swarm robots from MIT. I think I will maximize this. I want you to pay attention to the lights that you see on top of the robots. You'll see there's red, green, and blue. A couple of the blue robots get a little confused and eventually find their group. Okay, so they're separating, uh, they're separating into, uh, they're clustering into their own groups here. And once they have their own groups, they can each do a specific part of the task. In this particular case, each group at the beginning, although it's not seen in the video, elects a leader, and that leader sends out a signal saying, I'm green leader, all green robots approach, blue leader, red leader, uh, and so on. So we have a centralized control system here where every member of the subgroup is responding to its leader. That's fine. It gives us clustering into groups and then division of labor. But there's a problem with this. What is it? What if the leader's cut off from all the other robots? When is that likely to occur? Maybe not in this group. Think about the context here. We're trying to build robot swarms. We've decided we're going to try and have a leader that's going to signal to the other members of the group what to do. But there may be a problem in which sometimes members can't hear the leader. What conditions is that going to happen in? Okay, possibly. Much, much larger groups. Much, much larger groups, right? Those of you that are having problems with registering for courses, I'd like you to email President Sullivan and he'll take care of it for you, right? Doesn't make sense as the group gets larger and larger to have centralized control, right? You want to have as decentralized control as possible. Humans learn this lesson, and then they forget that lesson, and then they relearn that lesson, and so on. We are trying our best uh, to remember that lesson when we build robot swarms. How do we get around, how do we get away with decentralized control? Well, we already saw a great example of that. The Boyds do that. There is no Boyd leader. They're all doing exactly the same thing. And that works for simple tasks. There is another approach to this in robotics, which is uh, modular robots. And in this case, you have a robot swarm in which members of the swarm are sometimes physically connected uh, to one another. Um, so this makes things rather interesting because the individual pieces themselves are, again, relatively simple. Each one can, has limited sensing and movement capabilities. But as you put them together, the robot as a whole is obviously collecting more sensors and more motors, more different ways of moving, and richer ways of moving start to appear as it starts to collect modules, and its ability to sense more things better increases because the modular robot has more and more sensors uh, at its under its control. Okay, that's modular robotics. Let's have a look at one of these. Um, this is the Conroe robot developed at USC. You can go and read more about it. I'll show you a couple of videos uh, of it. Again, physical context here matters. The physical context is going to be the physical neighbors of each individual in the Conroe robot. So the Conroe robot, each element in this group has the ability to sense how many neighbors are actually attached to it. 
and it's going to run different Breitenberg vehicles. It's going to run some very, very simple pieces of code, and uh, it's going to decide which Breitenberg vehicle to run depending on how many neighbors it has. Okay. What can, a single, uh, what can a single object do? It can move back and forth. You'll notice when I run this video that there's a motor inside each element that can rotate two pieces relative to one another, and it can also sense, sense some external signals. Here we go. As you'll see in this video, the human is helping the robot to reconfigure. So in this case, we're gonna start with a snake robot. I'm going to turn it on, and power is going to start to flow along the length of this robot, and each element is going to start to do what it does. The local neighborhood of that element has just changed, as has the one that was separated. And the local neighborhood of that element has now also changed. So this element in the center here now has four neighbors and is altering its behavior a little bit, altering its motion. So now the front of the body here and the back of the body here, both of these elements now have four neighbors and they're both running exactly the same program. So every element has the same set of programs which, and it decides which one to run depending on number of neighbors. And we get a snake robot that moves or a quadruped that moves. Okay, I think in the rest of the video they put it back just to show you that this is reversible. Yes? What if you gave the robot the ability to like parse itself into those pieces? Do you think it would ever like get to the most optimal like way of reasoning? You mean like this? <laughs> You thought Jibo was scary, right? <clears throat> okay, not the most optimal reconfiguration. This work is still basically an engineering project, just figuring out how to actually do this, what this would be useful for, and the AI side of this, how would a robot learn what the most optimal configuration is for the task at, at hand? No one knows, it's a completely open question. Okay. Yes? Is it using evolutionary algorithms? It is not using evolutionary algorithms. There's no machine learning here. There's no evolutionary algorithms, no deep networks. Everything is pre-programmed. We just, the, the investigators here um, determined we need to write K Breitenberg vehicles for the K different neighborhoods that are possible. What is K? How many different neighbors can an element in this system have, given what you've seen from the two videos? Four, right? It can have zero, there can be a disconnected piece, one, two, three, or four neighbors. So possibly five conditions. We might make this position sensitive, which means I can have one neighbor to my left or one neighbor to my right, and I might want to have different Breitenberg vehicles uh, at play for those different conditions, or I'm going to play a Breitenberg vehicle if I have one neighbor, regardless of where it's attached. So it depends. You can get into some interesting combinatorics here, but no, no optimization. The interesting thing would then say, we want this modular robot to do something, use a machine learning algorithm where the robot figure, figures out what is the appropriate con physical configuration for the task at hand, 
and what should each element in that configuration be doing? Other questions? OK. That's modular robots. What about uh, self-reproducing robots? So assume that we now have one of these modular robots, and from time to time, there is an individual, mel uh, an individual element of the swarm that is nearby that can be incorporated into the swarm, what's possible. I'll play you the video in a moment. You can see, obviously, that the modules in this modular robot are, uh, robot are cubes. And cubes themselves are very, very limited in what they can do. Uh, you'll see it in the video, but you might be able to see it here. There's a cut through the grand diagonal of the cube so that the two triangles can rotate relative to one another. The plate, the plate that the robots are sitting on is magnetized and electrified so we can apply power and a magnetic force to the plate. And the cubes themselves have little magnets in them, electromagnets, that the cube can turn on and off to make itself attractive to or repellent to the floor or other members of the swarm. So far, so good? OK. Two robots from one. If we take away the parent and leave the child and we keep feeding the child, it will keep making copies of itself indefinitely. Luckily, the surface of the Earth is not yet covered in these machines because their food is very specific. It's elements of itself. Aside from the wow factor, why would one want to go about creating such a technology? Because like, robot swarms don't necessarily preserve themselves, so it would be useful for them to be able to replace themselves if Absolutely, yeah. Well, to expand on that, or to expand on that, uh, if like, this was some place where they could ever interact with humans like out in space and being able to replace parts of themselves. Absolutely. So this was, a, again, a prototype for NASA. Um, it's just one of many possible designs. It would be relatively easy for NASA to send uh, a system to uh, a planetary body and sprinkle these on the surface. And as long as two of them are sufficiently close that they connect, if there's two or more, they have limited movement capabilities. They might be able to go and find the third element that's close by. They can find a third one. Then together, the three of them can move a little bit faster than the two elements swarm, and so on and so forth. Much easier to send something in this modular distributed fashion and have the machines and the system put itself together on site, right? Autonomous IKEA here. Um, the idea of a self-replicating robot scares me a lot because it you, scares a lot of people a lot. If you make it um, kind of synthesize any material, you could have an Earth that just turned into these robots pretty quickly. Exactly. So if you're a fan of robotics or science fiction, you probably heard of the gray goo hypothesis, which is if robots, if we diversify the menu for them, that they can digest lots of different things, then we're really in trouble. And there's a lot of regulation about trying to create such devices so that there are only very, very specific things that they can eat. And if those things are not present, no uncontrolled self-replication occurs. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was that these robots can also repel themselves in the form. Yes. Which I think is really interesting because if a robot's heart is broken, it can say, hey, don't eat me. A absolutely, that's right. So it's especially if we're talking about um, extra, um, extra Earth activities on other planetary bodies, remote environments, 
These are very harsh environments. There's going to be a considerable level of attrition and damage, and we want to assume that that system can eject or reject parts that are no longer working, absolutely, which is difficult for a traditional robot to do. Okay. Okay, we have 15 minutes left, so we're going to do a little bit longer class exercise uh, to finish things off today. We're going to imagine not uh, another planet, but we're going to imagine this planet, and there is a very large natural uh, disaster. There's a disaster site, um, and there are human survivors somewhere within this area. We want to create a robot system that can find these human survivors and help them for as long as possible until human emergency services can get to the human survivors. How you define help is up to you. I want you to think about not just what we talked about today, modular robots and swarm robots, but possibly also uh, the social robots that we just talked about last time, Breitenberg vehicles. I want you to put this together into a system that can perform this task as best as possible. It's very difficult to imagine a large single robot that's going to be able to do well in this situation. It's also impossible to imagine a gazillion individual elements doing much. There is some sort of sweet spot in the middle. How would the system find that sweet spot? Okay, so um, we want to try and explore. Perhaps, they, perhaps the robots <coughs> provide, in this case, physical, literal scaffolding. How many robots are you going to use? How many modules per robot? Um, what will they configure into? How will they work together? Sensors, motors. You've got 15 minutes, so you can sketch something out here with your neighbor in a fair bit of detail. It's often hard to start thinking about a problem in this way. So I've given you a little uh, way to get started here. Imagine you have a modular robot like the one that you see here. What is the little Breitenberg vehicle that should run in these six elements where some of the actions that the Breitenberg vehicle can perform is turn on and off magnets? How would this thing climb stairs where the height of the stair is higher than a single element? You might want to start thinking about that one, and if you start to build up your intuition about designing modular robots, go back and tackle the disaster site. I'll give you about 10 minutes for this one, and then we'll spend the last five minutes talking about ideas that you've come up with. Good luck. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It is obviously, and I'm the first one to admit it, it's a lot of fun to think about designing uh, robots, but we're trying to design them for an obviously very serious and very pressing concern is dealing with uh, natural or perhaps man-made disasters, not an easy thing uh, to do. What are some ways in which swarm robotics might be able to help find human survivors at a disaster site? If you let out a swarm of locator robots, they just like have a button that you press when it finds you. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna put out a swarm of locator robots and survivors will press the button when the robot finds the survivor. In the next four minutes, I want you to, um, it's hard to do, but I want you to think carefully about physical and social context inside of a disaster site. Let's focus on uh, rubble after an earthquake. You have 100, possibly several hundred square miles of debris. Is that solution gonna work in this condition? Um, we said that the robots should find like a heat signature, like they would give off a certain heat signature, so they should be attracted to that. So there's two issues here. Find the, uh, find the survivors, and once you find them, how does the robot signal back that a human has been found? Right? So we need to find uh, possibly a large number of small objects, humans, inside of a very large area. Heat is one possible source. We could create a Bradenburg vehicle that follows heat. What else might be useful? What other signal might be useful here? Sound, so like you would try and help. So sound is probably gonna be useful as the first signal a machine picks up on in terms of the general, locate, general proximity of a human. You could have a Bradenburg vehicle that follows sound. If you think about most disaster sites, as long as it's a little bit after the disaster, it's very dark and very quiet. There's usually no power, so all machines have shut off. Often the only sound is from the human survivors. Sound will get you part of the way, but then heat might be useful as you get closer. What else do we need to think about? What other physical and social context matter here? Uh, Okay. They could all be their own little ball or, or a different shape and fall through the rubble, right? Remember our discussion about situated embodied cognition? You're probably going to be deploying these robots on the surface uh, of the debris, and they could obviously get into the system by relying on gravity. That might get them quite a bit of the way. They might start to alter their descent, then based on sound. I was thinking they could be used, like, once they found a person, they could be used as, like, a drone ship, like, just like hydraulic, push on each other. Okay. They could magnetize together and then push to make room, but you also have to consider when crushing someone else. Absolutely. Very difficult for a robot or a human to decide what to do once a survivor is found. You might try and leverage, they might try and reconfigure to leverage the debris off the human survivor, which may or may not be the right thing to do. Um, we said that inside at least a few of the modules, we could have different like, supplies for the humans, and then what we would do is we would cover the outside of the module with different languages. So okay. Okay, so maybe the robots are gonna bring in supplies. That's a good idea. Our survivors might not speak English, so we might wanna put text on the outside of the machine. Physical context. Are they gonna be able to read the text? Well, we also thought we'd include a light. Include a light, good, okay. No, that's fine, right? We need to think very carefully about the situation. Let's end by thinking about the human survivors themselves. And again, this is a difficult thing to do. What do most human survivors succumb to if they don't make it out of the disaster? Shock. Shock? They might be unconscious. They might be unconscious. So even if we have a light, we want them to read the supplies, they might be unconscious. What often causes them to succumb after the shock and falling unconscious? Dehydration. Dehydration. I have a colleague who works on soft robots, 
take your water bottle, imagine your water bottle is soft, and we're gonna wrap it with what's called shape memory alloy. It's a particular kind of wire. When, when, you when you heat that wire, it compresses, and when it cools, it expands. So we have a water bottle that's covered in SMA, and we have a little microcontroller, a little, little small computer that's controlling or able to emit heat and heat the wire or allow the wire to cool. And you have a Breitenberg vehicle now where the wires are going to compress and expand to get this water bottle down into the disaster site, hopefully through the disaster site and to the participant, uh, to the survivor. It might initially follow sound, then heat, but the last foot, the last, or the last meter is the most difficult. You have an unconscious person who may or may not be about to die of dehydration. What does the water bottle need to do during that last foot between itself and the participant? Someone who is trapped in rubble. What is the signal that it needs to, to use now? Heat will just bring it to the body of the participant. They need to get like the face. They need to get to the face and not just the face. Not the hands. We're going to assume this person to the mouth. How does the water bottle get to the mouth? Carbon dioxide. Remember our discussion about VO2 max, masks? Assuming the patient is, uh, the subject is still alive, they're breathing and they are emitting carbon dioxide, which would be the last signal to get the water bottle, assuming you can get there, to the patient and possibly supply water until other forms of support can get there. We'll leave things there. You have a quiz due tonight. Interim video uh, one tomorrow. Colin will be here on Thursday. I will see you after the Thanksgiving break. Have a good break.